Recording in progress. So good evening, everyone, and good morning or good afternoon to those of you who are listening on Zoom from other, other parts of the world. I'd like to welcome you to this side event co-hosted by the International Trade Union Confederation, which represents 200 million organized workers in 162 countries and the Canadian Labor Congress. Um, and we, we will get a more full introduction of the Canadian Labor Congress from two of our speakers on this panel. I'm very excited about that. So first I'd like to apologize for our General Secretary, Sharon Burrow. Um, she is one of the friends of COP and is busy working on some text. So uh, I will be moderating this event, but she sends us all her best wishes. Let me just tell you a couple of words about the Just Transition Center, of which I'm the director. So we were set up in 2016 to help unions get good plans for just transition. And we work with unions from high emitting countries in high emitting sectors around the world. So from India and Indonesia and Brazil to Canada and the United States and across the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, and of course, here in the United Kingdom. And we work primarily with workers and unions in sectors such as coal-fired power, mining, uh, oil and gas, steel, auto manufacturing, other forms of heavy industry, um, and of course, construction and transport. Because if we're going to do something meaningful about climate change, we will need to bring down emissions in every sector, starting with the energy sector, and that's going to mean changes to all jobs. So um, we were here in Glasgow at, w at the Conference of the Parties. And just to say that in case we're wondering what Just Transition is, someone has already worked this out for us. <laughs> so there is, in fact, a UN definition of Just Transition. We've got Just Transition in the, Par in the Paris Agreement. It's about the imperative of the Just Transition of the workforce and the creation of decent jobs um, uh, of, good jo of quality jobs and decent work. And then we also have a set of UN rules for just transition, which were negotiated by the International Labor Organization in 2015. So not to worry, if you're wondering what just transition is, we have answers for you. It's even been negotiated, and we can tell you about it uh, through this event. But tonight we're gonna to talk about something other than just the policies. We're gonna talk about what's happening in two countries that have been on the front lines of just transition, starting with Canada and going to South Africa. I just want to remind everyone that we have French and Spanish interpretation and that you have to log into the Zoom link in your invitation to access translation. You will need to use your own headphones if you want translation. So with no further ado, I'd like, I'm very excited to introduce the brand new, almost brand new, uh, Canadian Minister of Enviro Environment, the Honorable Minister Stephen Guibault. Um, and I have, I have a couple of questions for you. I know you have to leave right afterwards. So my first, my first question I hope is, is easy to answer. And it's that um, Canada was a world leader on just transition. So I, I remember when your Just Transition Task Force for Coal Communities was announced by the former minister, um, and it established a task force for Canadian coal power workers and communities. It was led by Canadian trade unions, and it did important work. It put forward practical recommendations to support coal power workers through the transition. And that transition is happening, right, in combination with the, with the carbon price. So we, but we know that the job isn't finished. Um, and so we would, we would just love to hear from you. Why was it important to have unions as part of this process? And how has that helped your government plan next steps, not only with respect to coal, but also with decarbonizing and other heavy emitting sectors? And how do you think this process is helping Canada to meet the emissions targets that it's set? Well, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, and when she says brand new, like 15, 15 days old in the, in the seat of uh, environment and climate change minister. But 
before that, uh, I, I was, some would argue, I still am an, an environmental activist. I have worked with, uh, with trade unions for many years. In fact, trade unions in Canada have been talking about fair tr or just transi transition for 15 years at, at, the at the very least. I remember having conversations many, many years ago about that. So you guys have been at the forefront of, of, of that debate in, in Canada. And, and you're right, what we did on coal so I was not I was not in government. Um, I, I I don't deserve any of the credit for, for 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 what was done. If only that it is my government that did it, but I wasn't there. But it was a fascinating exercise because, as you rightly pointed out, it was led by by trade union with civil so, civil society participants, people from the industry, and 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 what they did, what that task force did, is to go in 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 coal communities, either coal mining, uh, coal electricity production, and say, listen. We have a goal, and now it's a legislative goal in Canada to phase out coal by 2030. What does it mean for, for you as workers? What does it mean for your community? And how, how do we work to ensure that what, what, what is going to happen happens in a way that leaves no one behind? What would work for, in terms of economic development for, 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 for your community, in terms of training for, for workers? And, and when you read the report, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't want to say beyond the fact that it was led by trade unions, because it's really important, but what really comes out of the report is how people appreciated that we went and sat down with them and had those conversations, uh, as opposed to getting the feeling that sometimes these conversations are, are, hap are happening and they're not at the table. And that's not something we've done on, on, on oil and gas for a whole range of reasons, but this is something that we're going to do uh, on, on oil and gas. The work isn't done, and, and we have a, a, a campaign commitment to have a, a fair transition law. So we, we need to do it. It's going to involve many different ministries. Uh, I, I, I would imagine that Environment and Climate Change Canada will be part of it, but I, I could imagine that labor, uh, natural resources will, will, will be involved, in, and, and maybe some, so, some, others, some others as well. And I, I mean, again, it's this concept of how do we ensure that the decarbonization is done in collaboration with, with workers and community and not on the back of workers and, 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 affected, and affected communities. And we're having an interesting debate in Canada. Uh, our government was criticized during the pandemic. We provided, um, what, by Canadian standards, large amounts of funding to, uh, to help workers uh, in the oil and gas sector who couldn't work anymore, and we said, okay, well, what can we do? Well, we have all those, uh, those all those or orphan wells, the thousands of them. So, well, maybe oil, oil and gas people have expertise in, in, in this field. Let's put them to work, and we deployed more than one billion dollars to help people go back to work. And some have criticized this as saying, well, this is a fossil fuel subsidy, and I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it isn't. I mean, if if we are serious about just transition, then we need to help workers in, and communities in every affected sectors. We can't just say, well, we'll help sectors and workers in, in this part of our economy, but this part, no, we don't like it, therefore we won't help them. That's, that's not how I and that's not how my government views this. Well, so thank you for that. I mean, I think we agree it's not a fossil fuel subsidy. It was a critical moment to get people back to work. There's no question that abandoned wells are actually pumping methane into the atmosphere. And it's a very good skills match for oil and gas workers to remediate those wells. And many times the companies have skipped town, right? Nobody is gonna clean it up if the government doesn't, it doesn't do it. So, um, so you have, as you said, just come out of a, an election where your government was reelected. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, and there were some important uh, commitments coming out of the election, not only to help coal workers make the transition to high quality unionized low carbon jobs, but also other, other workers in communities and high emitting sectors. So you mentioned uh, the fair transition legislation. I'm kind of tempted to ask, why isn't it a just transition legislation and other priorities that Canada has to transition the workforce and those local economies? So can you tell us just a bit about the legislation? What's going to be in it? How you're going to involve unions in putting it together and in this process of getting people to the table? I, 
I might, I might have said fair. I, I probably meant just uh, transition. Um, I can't tell you mu much about it because we will need to be developing it. Yeah. But it's clear to me that we cannot do that without your involvement. There's, there's no way. And I've, I've spoken to some of um, one of my cabinet friends and colleagues, uh, main, Minister Seamus O'Regan, who used to be natural resource minister, who's now labor minister. Uh, we had our first cabinet meeting uh, just, uh, just two weeks ago. And he came to see me, and I mean, Seamus has, has been my, uh, my main source of, uh, of, uh, of, of a very precious things, which are Gwen Dyer's column. And for those of you who are not, can he, oh, actually he's known outside Canada, but he's, a, he's been writing, a, he's a pretty interesting per persona, and I really love his column. And Seamus, I'm not, I, I, don't, I, I can't get them except through Seamus, and he, he told me, if you don't involve me in, in, in the just transition discussion and the work that we will be doing together, that Canada will be doing, I'll stop sending you those columns. So that's a pretty big thing. And so that means that Seamus wants to be part of this. And he, so as Labour Minister, he will be involved. We, we don't know yet exactly who's going to be leading. We will be, be, be receiving what we call mandate letters yes. from the Prime Minister, so the instructions that the Prime Minister provides to each of his cabinet ministers. So we don't know exactly the composition of who's going to do what, who's going to be leading, but I suspect labor, natural resource, environment are going to have a role to play, and, and perhaps other, uh, uh, other ministers around, uh, around the table. You were talking earlier about how oil and gas workers were, were well adapted to, to doing something like decontaminating uh, orphan wells. I mean, you've probably heard it like I have, uh, those conversations about hydrogen, uh, about, about new technology. Not only was I an environmental activist, but for 10 years I, I also was an advisor to a venture capital fund in Canada that is dedicated to clean technologies. And, and uh, one of the companies they've invested in is a company called Enerchem, and the first plant of that company is in Edmonton. In, Al in Alberta, it's a Quebec company, but their first plant is, is in Edmonton. And basically what they do is they turn urban waste, once you've recycled and, and compost, uh, with the exception of electronic waste, but everything that's left, they turn it into ethanol and methanol. And, and I visited a plant, and when you, look at, when you look at the plant and when you understand how it operates, it looks a hell of a lot like a, like a refinery. Uh, and it's the same type of, of trades and skills that will be needed to do these types of new technologies, to do hydrogen. So for, for, for my government and, and for me personally, again, we need to have those, those people, those, those, those expertise, this knowledge at the table when we talk about, uh, about the just transition. It, it needs to be, part of the con it, to be part of the conversation. Well, I'm actually very happy to hear you say that because uh, right as we're speaking, we're having another online meeting with U.S. Labor, with U.S. Building Trades, about a big hydrogen project in, in California. And I know that there's a lot of excitement also on this side of the Atlantic in Europe about hydrogen and its role in decarbonization. So it's very interesting to hear this is going to be part of, of Canada's strategy too. And as you say, great fit for people who today are working in oil and gas, including in refineries. So, is there anything else you'd like to you'd like to tell us? You've got quite a few labor people in the room, as well as people from South Africa. Probably many people listening in. You know, we have very high expectations. No pressure, but Canada. As you should. <laughs> it really was a great moment for the global labor movement when Canada established this first Just Transition Task Force for communities. So we have, we're also really excited about your legislation. So any other messages you'd like to give us? Well, we, I mean, we've, all, we've been talking about the, the, the energy sector for, for very good reasons, but our climate change strategy is about retrofitting buildings. We will need skilled, trained workers to do that. We, we are currently making record level investment in, in public transit. Right now in Canada, 300 new transit projects are being constructed. Uh, more than a, a thousand are, are in the course of being of being approved. We will need people, skilled people, to build and operate those those transit system. So, I mean, it's about it's about energy, it's about building, it's about transportation, it's about agriculture, it's about many sectors where we will need your your expertise, your knowledge to to, to make this this transition a successful one. 
Thank you very much. There are a lot of decent jobs in what you just described. Music to our ears, labor standards in the legislation. Okay, thank you very much, you. Minister. We appreciate it. So we're going to excuse the minister now. He has to run off for more negotiations. Just transition in the text. Thank you so much. Okay. Larry, so it's also a great pleasure to introduce Larry Rousseau, who is the Executive Vice President of the Canadian Labor Congress, our co-host, and also, uh, what should I say, a partner in crime, partner in, in good trouble. Good uh, just trouble. Transition. Good trouble. So Larry, the Canadian Labor Congress, I mean, it's not a coincidence that Canada had the first Just Transition Task Force. Um, it's because Canada, Can Canadian labor has worked on this issue for a long time and really pushed it politically, but also with members to make sure that you had that, that base of support. And the Canadian Labor Congress uh, is again leading by adopting a, a really ambitious climate action agenda at your last Congress. Um, so can you just give us a few highlights of that agenda? Well. I, I, you know, uh, first, before I start, uh, I just want to say that when I just heard uh, Stephen, I was going to say the minister, but, you know, I'm feeling more and more we can just call him Stephen. Uh, he was talking, uh, he, he mentioned FAIR, and it hit me. You know, we're, we're, we're in a bilingual town in Ottawa. Juste, in it's French, fair. is FAIR. Yeah. And, and so people are getting that kind of mixed up, and I think that's all it is. Yeah. because we understand just transition and transition just. Mm -hmm. So, so to, to be fair, okay, that, that's it. And then he's way too humble. As an activist, the Canadian Labour Congress, we work with activists all the time. They help us set our agenda. They help us get the work done on the ground. And it's people, it's the activists on the ground that help us bring this agenda forward. So, uh, you know, when, we, when we're looking at what we're doing as far as fair transition is concerned, it really is about decent jobs. It's about making sure that there's quality work out there and that it's full-time work and that it's unionized jobs because in any community, when we see good jobs in the community, we know that community is going to prosper, it's going to thrive, the kids are going to be fine, so that's what we want in just transition. We want just transition to make sure that our communities really are thriving and going into the new economy. So when we talk about it in our conventions, when we put our resolutions forward, it's only normal. We, our activists in the union just want what's best for everybody. And we know that that's what's best for everybody. Really it is. Well, thank you. And I think there is one other thing that we want that Canadian labor has also been really good at getting, and that's that we want to be at the table when the decisions are made. Yep. And so we hope that that's also going to be a part of this new legislation. And, 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 and the thing is that uh, the minister, uh, he mentioned, uh, you know, when, when you asked him about the legislation, it is absolutely quite, uh, it's going to be quite wonderful, in fact, to have three different departments to have people in those three different departments. I'm looking at Christine, who's the D DM, the deputy minister at one department, but we can see that the other two departments, people are gonna have to work together yeah. to make sure that we get this right. And so that is absolutely crucial to this. So as the legislation is being crafted and they're going to be looking at us, the CLC, they'll be looking at Unifor, they'll be looking at the FTQ, they'll be looking at everyone to come together and say, what's the best way to do this? And we'll give our input because we can look that when we're looking at the climate change plans, we need a plan. Number one, we need to know where we're going. People have to know. And that includes the people who are on the ground in the community. Because if people on the ground, you know, we've, we've for 150 years, we've been, and even longer than that, a boom and bust economy in Canada, the natural resources. We've got the second largest territory in the world with one half of 1% of the population. So we've been kind of lazy. 
all right, entrepreneurial wise. And that is, the resources are there, we just extract them and we ship them and we make the profits, but we're not really thinking about the sustainability. So when we're thinking about this and when we're doing this, we have to make sure that we're doing it right. And going forward, as we go into the new economy, we're not throwing workers out onto the street once the profits are over, once we've extracted. No, we've got to think about the next step. What is the sustainability here, and how are we going to make sure that workers are going to be going into the next economy as we transition out of the current one? Yeah, thank you very much, Larry. <coughs> well, so now I'd like, to, I'd like to introduce another great Canadian trade unionist, Tara Peel, who's the National Director on Health, Safety, mm. and Environment, also from the Canadian Labor Congress. And Tara, you were on the task force, the Just Transition Task Force for Canadian Coal Power Workers and Communities. And so you, you all went out to, the, to coal communities, you had town halls, you went to union halls, met with all the union members who were fearful about their futures. What did you hear from workers? And how do you think you can build on that and build on, on the work of the task force with this legislation that's coming and that's going to cover sections beyond thermal coal? Sure. Thanks, Sam. Um, and, uh, oh, I guess I need this. <laughs> you, I'm sorry, you do. I you do. With the trade union voice. Yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. Mm. Thanks, uh, Sam. So before I start, I just want to say, and I, you know, I, we've all been saying this for the last two weeks and for years before that, just transition is the key to unlocking the ambition we need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. It is the way that you build the support, the consensus to go as far as we need to, as fast as we need to. It's deeper, not more shallow. It's the way we go faster, not slower. So I just feel like I need to open with that. Um, you know, I was really honored to participate on that task force. Um, And we did. We we started our we started our mandate heading out to coal affected communities and meeting with uh, unions and local members and communities and all you know trade chambers of commerce really lots of people. But when we sat in those rooms and affected workers came in and sat down and they saw their union sitting across the table from them, it mattered. It mattered to them. And it allowed them to open up and talk a little bit about what their fears were, what their hopes were, what they needed. And I just want to share uh, one, one particular example. We were meeting with a group of coal miners and, uh, you know, they came in ready for a fight. I think they thought they were going to come in and talk to government and say, this is a terrible idea. Don't do this. And when we explained who we were and what we were there to do, um, you know, there was one guy, one, one guy, and you could see it was like he had a light bulb moment. He said, and he said, you know, this is going to be the hardest thing that we ever go through. And he said to his fellow coal miners, you know, this is our chance to tell them what we need and tell them what we, and, and, and then he turned to us and he said, you know, we need you to make sure that we're not going to go through this alone and that when we need it, because they're still working, but when we need it, we're going to have the supports that we need to transition to new jobs or for the older workers uh, to transition uh, into a, a, a dignified retirement. And, you know, we did see this everywhere we went. Uh, the, the older workers would come over and say, you know, don't worry too much about me. It's these young guys. And the, the young guy, the young guys would say, you know, we'll be okay, but make sure you look after those older guys. And so this solidarity sort of ran through this process. Um, so, and it built trust, trust where, there do, where it doesn't really exist, you know? And so we have to make good on that trust. We need to not uh, let it um, dissipate because it will just make the next steps harder if we don't make good on that. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about this proposed legislation looking forward. How do we build on the work of the task force? As we know, there is still lots of work to do for these coal workers. Um, uh, and, you know, the transition is taking place at different speeds in different parts of the country. So there is time, but we have to make sure that we start doing that work. And I think that, that this legislation is sort of key to that. Um, so what do we need this, this legislation to do? We need to make sure that it, it recognizes that this transition is already underway. 
both in coal and in other sectors. People are um, already in the transition. So we need to think about how we build in those supports. Um, we need to make sure, and, and, and as you said, Sam, and Larry said, that workers are at the table. That this is, you know, we have a uh, we have a few sayings relevant to this in our movement, but you know, nothing about us without us is a big one. Uh, there's also maybe a more sort of tongue-in-cheek that if you if you're not if you're not at the table, it's very likely you're on the menu. And so we are very clear that we need to be at the table shaping these these pathways forward. Um, we need to, this legislation to find a mechanism to provide supports for individual workers. Things like wage top-ups, skills training, mobility supports, uh, pathways to retirement for workers who maybe are at a different place in their, their working life. Um, it, 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 it needs, you know, we need um, commitments to ensure that the transition creates high quality union jobs, as we've said, uh, and pathways for displaced workers to move into those jobs. Um, you know, workers are not going to willingly trade their family and community sustaining jobs for low wage precarious work. And so we should not be surprised if there is resistance, if we don't ensure that these new jobs are good jobs and that there's pathways for people to, to get into those jobs. We're going to need significant investment in skills training and unions know what their members need. And so member unions need to be at the table shaping those skills programs. Um, we're going to need things like infrastructure projects that have federal investment to require things like community benefits agreements um, and explore building them with project labor agreements the way that the New York State offshore wind did, because that is how you ensure good quality jobs. And it helps, you know, we can't build this economy with a race to the bottom uh, uh, on wages and working conditions and labor standards. Um, We need, you know, I, I opened with this about workers needing to be at the table, but we need to be at the table in a way that is more than just an advisory power. We need an advisory capacity. We need some ability. Workers need the power to really, you know, we know how to negotiate, and we know that when you negotiate an agreement with employers and governments around the table, that you get the best outcomes. You get the best outcomes in terms of the, the, the projects and the plans. You get the best outcomes for the workers themselves. It, um, and so we need workers at the table, both at a, at a national central table. We need workers at the table in by sector because this transition is going to look different and the workers and communities are going to need things in different ways, sector by sector. And we need it down to the workplace level. We need things like mandated joint workplace adjustment committees so that uh, employers who will also have a role in this transition and in transitioning their workforce um, need to negotiate that with the, the, the people who live there or who work there. So that's I think that's it for me. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and, and so, uh, yes. that is also, sorry. Oh, that's also the time, eh? That's right. Done. Okay, good. So that's also the essence of just transition, actually. It's not just a consultation with workers and many others, like the core of just transition is what's called social dialogue on this side of the Atlantic. So it's workers and their unions, it's employers and it's governments negotiating the things that relate to work and climate change. And so it would be gr just exceptional if the new legislation from Canada also manages to put that into the structure. So I want thank to ca thank Canadian Labor Congress for your amazing work for helping to, to get this panel. And I want to then welcome our South African comrade, Lebohang Mulesi, um, up, to, up to the stage so we can start talking about South Africa. Thank you so much, Larry, and thank you, Tara. Thank you. So, um, so before we give the Canadians a hand. So before we before we get started with the with you, Lebo Hung, I think we have a greeting from your minister, like all the other ministers, their general secretary. She is off negotiating as we speak, um, but she did manage to record a video, um, a video intervention. So we're going to play that now. This is an intervention from South Africa's Minister of Environment, Forestry, and Fisheries, Barbara Creasy. 
who sits on the Presidential Coordinating Commission for, on Climate Change, where you also sit, comrade. So let's hear from the minister first, and then we'll go over to you, Lebo. Perhaps what is important for, the, for this afternoon's discussion is the decision that our president made in February this year to set up the Presidential Climate Commission. And the purpose of the commission is to advise government on how to achieve its aspiration of having a mid-century low emissions economy and a climate resilient society. Now, what we all understand is that such have to be fulfilled by government of its, uh, on its own. It requires a whole of society approach, a whole of the economy approach. And this is why the Climate Commission has been established with representative the private sector, civil society, and most importantly, organized labor. And all of our major trade union federations are represented on the Climate Commission. Now, in addition to advising government on low emissions pathways in the seven vulnerable sectors of our economy, the Climate Commission also will have central responsibility for ensuring that the transition that our society embarks upon is a just transition. Now, when we talk about climate justice, what we understand is that in any technological change, there will be winners and losers. We understand that very often the winners are those who own the new forms of technology and the losers are workers and communities in the value chains associated with the older technology. What we also understand about climate justice is that while developed nations are primarily responsible for climate change. It is developing countries such as ours, which are warming up at twice the global rate, that actually will carry and experience the full brunt of climate change. So climate justice is an issue between developed and developing countries. It's an issue within, within countries and it's also an issue within industries. So we want to ensure that as we approach the climate transition, we do it in a manner that helps us with the broader object objectives of our national development plan. We believe that there are significant opportunities in new green technology, opportunities to create work, opportunities to create new enterprises and opportunities to to promote economic inclusion and it is our view that the transition to a greener economy must assist us in tackling the wicked problems we face of unemployment poverty and inequality so how do we envisage that we're going to implement all of these lofty principles. And I think that when we first established the Climate Commission and we, de we debated these issues, we said that it was very important that we must set up a proof of concept project where we can understand what exactly are the socioeconomic issues in the value chains in communities surrounding the power stations that are due for decommissioning in the integrated resource plan of 2019. We said we want to understand what does reskilling and upskilling workers mean? What does it mean to repurpose these power stations, either with renewables or gas? What would it mean to set up upstream and downstream industries that could create new economic opportunities for women and youth and other historically disadvantaged people who live in the communities in Mpumalanga that, in, that surround these coal-fired power stations that are due for decommissioning. Kamati is our proof of concept project. 
we are in the purpose in the process of repurposing that power station for the generation of renewable energy we're in the process of understanding what it means to upskill and reskill workers and we're in the process of understanding what it will mean to set up upstream and downstream industries that can support the new repurposing that we have in mind. And currently we are doing socioeconomic studies in, in the four of the other power stations that are due for decommissioning in due course. ESCOM, of course, has developed a much broader plan uh, for the repurposing of power stations that are due for decommissioning. And ESCOM re refers to this as the transaction. Central to this plan is the benefit that workers and communities can derive from the transition to a greener economy. Now, all of you would know that uh, last week on Tuesday, the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany and France announced a support offer to South Africa's just transition. And this offer is uh, it's uh, 8.5 billion US dollars or 131 billion South African rands. And it is at this stage an offer we would need to put together a negotiating team together with the developed countries. We would need, as South Africa, to put together a high level financial work stream so that we can unpack the offer and understand the, the financial implications and how such an offer could be compatible with our domestic regulatory environment. And uh, of course, uh, we are also very mindful of the fact that our country already has a debt burden and ESCOM's balance sheet is not, is not as strong as it could be. So all of these considerations we would need to be advised on by the high level panel. But central to the political pledge that was made by the four countries um, and, and the EU last week, was an understanding of our concept of climate justice and the central role that organized labor and the private sector would need to play in the development of any investment plan and the development of any transition transaction. I think it's important to share with you that included in the basket of programs for consideration is the development of uh, green hydrogen. This is uh, an area where South Africa potentially has considerable advantage, not only because of the important technology and intellectual property owned by Sasol, but also because we are amongst the 10 most sunny countries in the world. And obviously sunshine is an important input for renewable energy and for the, for the green hydrogen value chain. We're also looking at the issue of electric vehicles because we understand that vehicle manufacturing is a very important sector of our economy and a sector where there are quality jobs at the moment. And we would want to make sure that as the globe transitions to electric vehicles, South Africa is involved in these manufacturing value chains. The conservative estimate the ESCOM provision of a uh, proposal is that repurposing of power stations with renewables and gas, expansion of, of the grid, creation of microgrids, all of this could create conservatively estimated somewhere in the region of about 300,000 jobs. We haven't yet done the numbers around the grid hydrogen economy or the electric vehicle manufacturing but it is our belief that these sectors will unlock significant employment and enterprise creation for the future of our country allow me to to pause there and to say that these are exciting developments of course the work is only just beginning 
and it will be very important that organized labor is a strong and active partner because without that we will not be able to ensure that the transition is just and that the socio-economic objectives of fighting poverty, inequality, unemployment, and economic exclusion are achieved through the green transition. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, um, speaking of music to our ears, uh, now we have another, another minister, this time from South Africa, speaking of the central role that organized labor must play in the just transition. And Lebohang, you are the labor market coordinator for Kasatu. Uh, you sit in the national uh, social dialogue body, NEDLAC. You've been in these, these negotiations about the future of the power sector and mining in your country. And you're also one of the labor commissioners on the Presidential Coordinating Commission on Climate Change, which was the result of collective bargaining and social dialogue by trade unions a few years ago at the at the presidential job summit so so welcome first of all and i wanted to hear how unions are incorporated into the discussions at the p for c as it's called the presidential commission and what is the work that, what is the work that you're doing right now Thanks, Sam, um, and thank you to the ITUC, uh, as well as the Just Transition Center for inviting South Africa to come and talk about um, the experience. When the minister talked about the bright sun of South Africa, I missed it even more, because we definitely have a lot of it. Um, maybe just to say that, you know, the, the establishment of the P4C, which is the short term, because nobody wants to say Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission, the P4C's establishment was as a result of, like you said, bargaining at a national level because really what we saw as a trade union movement was that, what is usually said, a transition is happening and it's happening on multiple um, facets. And if we allow it to continue as is, what we would effectively be doing is making sure that workers have been left behind by a transition. So it's the responsibility of the trade union to make sure that we table the demands of workers and we do this in a multi-stakeholder platform where we can get them the voices of business, we can get the voices of government and various other um, interest parties so that we can craft a way forward for a just transition. I must say, I, I will commend the, the South African government and you've probably heard it in the utterances by uh, Minister Creasy. I don't think we have to advocate for a just transition. Well, the term, in, its, in, in the term, we don't have to really drive that one really hard these days because South Africa understands that because of our unique challenges, our hope and our opportunities really lie in a just transition. And I don't think we, we need to convince government much more on this imperative um, anymore. Yes, different stakeholders may interpret the just transition to mean various different things, but I think as a concept, and this is really due to the work of the cl global trade union movement, that you know this term that we coined, and we coined it because we didn't want communities or workers to be left behind, is now finding its expressions in key documentation. And it's finding its expression in the work that South Africa wants to endeavor. And the fact that the South African government can notice that you know this is a key opportunity. And if you're going to have a transition that is fair, it has to have justice within it. And, and that's been the key role that the trade unions have played in the various debates around you know, justice. So it's not even an, an issue of debate anymore. I think if, if you want to talk about issues of transition to a low carbon economy, it has to be done within the frameworks of a just transition. Yeah. That is very good to hear. But so what are the principles? So first of all, just to recognize Kasatu and others as South African unions for your leadership on the term just transition, because actually Kasatu was the first national federation in, in the world to have a policy on just transition. So you've had a policy on just transition for more than a decade now. So what are the principles of just transition in South Af Africa? We've got the global principles, but we know that just transition, those principles are gonna look a little bit different, applied a little bit different in different countries. 
And then how are those principles embedded in the just transition framework that you're developing for, for your country? And before I even get to that, thank you for highlighting the fact that you know the just transition is going to look slightly more different in the global south than what it's looked like um, in the global north for, for significant reasons. Um, we, we come from high levels of poverty, high levels of inequality and unemployment, so it's definitely going to have to look um, significantly different than, than what it has. But I think we're, we're all chasing the same imperative, the issue of justice and making sure that you know workers are not being left behind um, in the just transition. Um, and also maybe just to say one thing, and this informs the principles of a just transition, and I always mention this story every time I do any engagement um, around the first time I, I did a worker education on this brilliant concept of a just transition, and I went into one of the mines, and I think I, th I thought about it when Tara was speaking, and in the back of the room somewhere there was this very elderly man from the mines who asked me, I, I hear these concepts and I hear what you're saying, but can I eat this just transition? And I think at the end of the day, that's what people are asking about. So in his, word, in his way, he was explaining the livelihood aspect that these issues must be attached to. We realize this, that we're not going to sell technical terms to workers. We're not going to sell high ideas to workers. If we can't make these issues speak to the bread and butter issues of workers, then we've, we've lost the fight and we've lost the issues of principle. So the principles are embedded in workers' livelihoods. So issues of training, skilling, and upskilling, and lifelong learning are going to be central to just transition, especially in South Africa. We have to understand that workers who are, particularly in the core value chain, these are low-skill workers who enjoy high uh, earnings relative to people who are equally as unskilled as what they are. So another element of it is going to be the centrality of collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is going to be a key principle in the just transition. If we are going to want to maintain the decent work agenda, if we're going to want to maintain wages, if we're going to want to maintain labor standards, so the issue of collective bargaining is going to be high on the agenda. The issue of comprehensive social security. Now in South Africa, we've got social security. Is it adequate? Some will say yes, some will say no, but it's definitely not comprehensive. So what we're definitely going to have to do is to also get the ideas of, 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 of and cement the issues of comprehensive social security. It's going to have to have an element of housing, social housing policies even, and housing policies on the side of the employer. The fact that South African workers don't become homeowners until they access their retirement monies at the end of their working life is a terrible indictment on our society. It's going to also have to accompany issues such as whether we're able to provide you know, free higher education for, for, for people who have been working in, in the various mines. I don't know how you ask somebody to take an early retirement when they still have dependents that have not accessed early higher education. I wouldn't take that offer. Um, so, so these are the things that are going to underpin the principles of a just transit. Higher education in South Africa is very expensive. So nobody's going to take an offer of an early retirement if you're not linking it to, to some of these issues. Access to health, comprehensive health, national health insurance, um, universal health coverage, those issues are going to be issues of centrality. The people that we've committed to mines are, are sick when they leave the mines. And the nice thing about them being in the work that they're doing and those collective bargaining agreements, they give them they give them incredible health benefits. So how do you ask somebody who's now going to leave those sectors to, to let go of those health provisions? We're going to have to give them access to health, um, universal health coverage. So those at, at the basic are going to be the principles of our just transition at least. Thank you, Lebohang. And you mentioned also that in, in South Africa, because of your very high unemployment rate at the moment, that a real just transition would mean creating four good jobs for every one job that disappears. So that's really what it's going to take. So when we look at this 300,000 jobs that ESCOM says can be, can, uh, can be created, it's actually just making a dent in the unemployment that is already there. But that has to be the goals. So I want to I wanna thank you. Um, we're going to see now a video from the president of the AFL-CIO, the US National Federation, Liz Schuler, who's going to talk to us about just transition at home 
but also about expectations for just transition in US climate finance and development finance abroad. Because the United States is apparently one of the governments that has signed this, uh, this political agreement with South Africa. So we want to be sure that when the US is putting money into coal phase out or just transition, that we're at the table, that our voices are heard, and that that, um, that climate finance is going to lead to, the, to what you just described, to decent jobs and social protection for workers and communities. So please let me introduce uh, President Schuler of the AFL-CIO, who's going to give us some video remarks. Hello, I'm Liz Schuler, President of the AFL-CIO, a federation of 57 national and international unions representing nearly 13 million working people. We are talking about a just transition for working people as we address the climate crisis. But here is the challenge of building a just transition. We've never seen one before. We've seen transitions for short-term gain. We've seen transitions that have created enormous wealth for a few and widespread hardship for working people. We don't want to repeat the bad policy choices of the past that left communities stranded. Free trade, deregulation, outsourcing, precarious work, the rise of the gig economy, you name it, working people have been shortchanged. It can't be like that in the fight against climate change. The stakes are way too high. The urgency of this moment demands that we learn from that past. No, we haven't seen a just transition before, but we can envision it. Each person, every place included. High road, good union jobs for everyone. Environmental protection. Progress for racial justice, gender equity. A just transition to a sustainable, equitable future means solidarity. That all working people have a voice. At work, in our political processes, in climate outcomes, and unions are the vehicle for worker voice and for worker power. We belong at every table where climate decisions are made. The Paris Agreement calls for a just transition because worker voices at those tables demanded it through our unions. And just a few days ago, the US and many other governments signed a just transition pledge, a welcome step that we now need to make real with actions on the ground, not just words on paper. The values of the ILO in international climate policy, development, and finance are more important now than ever. Without those values, it's just a transition. But we need a just transition with labor rights and union growth. No one left behind. Think about this. There's a difference between a coal company and a coal community. Look at Alabama, for example. Warrior Met, a company driven by corporate greed, has denied miners a fair share of the value that those workers create. Miners have been on strike since April, seven months. That injustice and inequity hurts the entire community children and teachers, nurses and social workers. And before those communities suffer the economic impacts of displacement, they need support. So we applaud President Biden's interagency working group on coal communities. Labor is at the table and it makes such a difference. The AFL-CIO will continue to push for full funding of these investments. Wage replacement and health care for those laid off a bridge to a pension, job training programs that give people the choice to stay and prosper in their local communities. We need ongoing social dialogue and stakeholder engagement, economic strategies that center on working people. And we need to guarantee our rights to stand together in trade unions so we can make sure that clean energy jobs are good jobs with benefits and retirement security. Look, work connects all of us. And in every part, in every link, every step of the supply and value chains, that should also include the highest labor standards. Offshore wind, 
solar, electric vehicles, and more. No exceptions. Every clean energy sector, every company, we are calling on you. Supply family supporting union jobs now. We are going to continue to build a broad and inclusive coalition for political momentum. Connecting marginalized communities, people of color, women, and every working person in every industry. We are growing a bold, inclusive labor movement to meet this moment, to leverage our power with our governments, to create more balance in the economy, to bring people in from the margins of the informal economy. We can create a fair, sustainable future through solidarity. And we are determined to keep raising our voices through our unions. That's how we will make the just transition a reality. Thank you. Oh. So now you've heard it from quite a few labor leaders and ministers. Um, I want to say that last week, the Canada, the United States, the UK, the uh, Germany all signed on to a just transition declaration committing them to the just transition principles of the International Labor Organization and the creation of good new jobs in their climate finance for energy transition. So American labor is gonna hold them to account. We know Canadian labor is gonna do that. South Africa will do it at home. So rather than try to, to wrap up what has been a really great discussion, I'd actually like to give the last word to the trade unionists who have been kind enough to speak with us this evening. I'm going to start with you, Larry. Uh, then I'll go to Tara and Lebohan. You will uh, you'll be giving us your your last thought. Yes, um, I really I really enjoyed what you said. And one thing that we know that we do well is when we bring workers to the table, we have workplace committees. We bring workers to the table, but we also bring in the principles of equity. So that means that we will be dealing with indigenous workers, responsibilities and rights. We will be looking at workers of color. We will be, we will be looking at gender balance, and we will be looking at workers with disabilities. And we know how to do this, and we know how to do it in a just, way. That is what we know that we can achieve. And when we do that, when we talk about the crisis of the end of the world, then we can talk to the people who are wondering about, well, I'm not so concerned about the end of the world as much as I'm concerned about the end of the month. And that is when we bring it together and we can have the support that we need so people can, can feel that it will be just for them. Thank you, brother. Really inspiring words about how we make the just transition an inclusive transition, equitable for everyone. Tara. Uh, thank you. That's great, Larry. Hard to, hard to follow that. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll just build on that a little bit and talk just for a moment about the importance of the public sector in this. We've just come out of a pandemic where we've seen sort of both sides of that coin where We've seen sort of, you know, uh, years and decades of underfunding kind of left us a little bit short off the top. We, you know, we weren't, we had some challenges. But at the same time, I don't think anybody in my country could imagine getting through this pandemic without a strong public sector. And so as we are planning this just transi this, this transition, um, we're going to need to make sure that, that, that this is, driven by good public sector jobs in the planning and the research in all of those pieces. So I just, you know, we're talking a lot about uh, sectors that are largely covered by the private sector, but there is a really important role for the public sector in this transition as well. Yes, I just want to second that because a just transition rests on quality public services. Lebohan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so maybe just to build on what Tara says. Um, so we're not gonna build this on pure market mechanisms. Uh, we're gonna need the state to step it up a bit here. 
Um, the social imperatives of the just transition are located squarely within the role of the state. That's just what it is. So we're going to need to strengthen the state. I think the Presidential Climate Change Commission is, is tired of hearing me scream about where's the state, we need to strengthen the state, but, but this is important. And for reasons that Tara has mentioned, can you imagine being in this pandemic and the state was not as active as what it was? We would have been in serious trouble. But another thing we're going to be you know, holding on to and, 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 and wanting to collaborate is, is making sure that, you know, coordination between trade unions is alive and is active. So we're going to want to call on, you know, our American brothers and sisters, Canadian brothers and sisters, because we think this is where we're going to share, you know, all our expertise. Um, in the transaction, we're going to want more <laughs> grant financing <laughs> as compared to loans. Um, we're going to need to wage the war on both fronts, so we're going to be calling on all our international brothers and sisters to make that call for us, um, because we think in strong coordination, especially among trade unions of the world, is how we achieve a broader and more global imperative of a just transition. Um, so, so that's going to be what we're going to be looking forward to, and we feel that we, f we win this fight when we're together. Yes, solidarity. Solidarity, solidarity. forever. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Your words were really inspiring. Yes, 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 indeed. <laughs>